Hello everyone, how are you all? Today on Scottish Memories, we are chatting to the Lord Provost of Edinburgh. So how are you all? Hope you are all happy and healthy and safe out there, wherever you are. Just before we get started, if you haven't already, please remember to hit that subscribe button, hit that like button, and if you enjoy the interview afterwards, please remember to leave a comment as well, let me know. But today, I am genuinely honoured today because I am joined by Frank Ross, the Right Honourable Lord Provost and Lord Lieutenant of the City of Edinburgh. Lord Provost, hello, how are you? Very well, Tony, very well. And, and, and it's easier just to call me Frank rather than Lord Provost all the time. That's, that's very kind of you. I didn't know what the <laughs> protocol was. Um, so <laughs> that makes it a little bit easier. Thank you very much. First, I, I have to say, I, I turn up to so many events and, and, and so many dinners and everybody else has got a name plaque with their name on it. And I don't have a name. I'm just a Lord Provost. I usually score it out and put my name on it. <laughs> I suppose as well, because if you're wearing your full attire, it yeah. must be quite easy for people to know who you are as well. <laughs> it's a bit of a clue. <laughs> yeah. And thank you so much for sparing the time and uh, to come okay. and to me today. It really, really does mean the work, because I can imagine your schedule's probably quite full. Um, it is. At the very beginning of the lockdown, it became quite empty, because obviously we're not doing very many civic events, yeah. as you can imagine. Um, but actually, because people have become more used to and more comfortable with technology, actually the workload's picked up again. And, and you know, events like this, I think I've got about five today of, of, of different meetings. Right. On, unfortunately, always on different platforms, which doesn't make life <laughs> overly, I know. overly simple. <laughs> I have to say, though, for me, I, I, I'm kind of the same. For me, because obviously the, my normal uh, schedule for the channel is going out and exploring Edinburgh and sharing it with the world. But the lockdown did give, the, give me the opportunity to start this, which has been incredible, talking to some amazing people like yourself just about the country that, you know, we all grew up in, which is lovely. Yeah. The, the technology is amazing what we can do now. Um, well, just before we get started, how are you anyway? Are you okay? Yeah, very well, very well. Getting uh, getting a bit bored with not living, just existing, it has to be said. Um, you know, there's, there's, there's lots of things that you used to take for granted that uh, just don't happen anymore, you know? Yeah, um, yeah I know, I know. I absolutely it's, know. Uh, it's a bit tricky, but hey, ho, it's, hopefully it won't be for much longer. Yes. Uh, I'll dive right in with the questions, if yeah. I, okay? So, uh, growing up, did you get a chance to travel around uh, Scotland as a youth on holidays or daybreaks or anything like that? Yeah, well, I, I, I'm off the vintage rather than the age. I'm off the vintage that um, foreign, foreign travel was not uh, the norm as it is today yeah. in terms of holidays. So, Scotland was our holiday base until... I think until I was a teenager, and then and then we went to Holland camping for the first time ever. That was a that was a huge adventure. <laughs> but um, I also have, I mean, uh, sort of holidays and day trips. But for us back in my youth, certainly before I became a teenager, you know, a trip to Perth was a full day out. Yeah. Just to get there, spend an hour there, and come back again. Yeah. Um, I have the youngest memory of of being in a car on Hawes Bray. Uh, waiting our turn to get on the ferry uh, to take us across the fourth. Um, I must have been about four or five at the time. Um, yeah. So that was, you know, a, a, a day out there. But no, all our holidays were spent in Scotland. Um, day trips, and again, in my very early years, we used to have a station here in Christorfin, uh, and you could get on the train as a family and go down to North Berwick for the day. Yeah. Um, and, and, and lots of people did. The trains were always full. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but summer holidays, most summer holidays were spent um, probably Fife in around uh, Kinghorn and uh, Burnt Island. Yeah. That, was a, that was a favourite place. Again, you could get there by train. Um, you know, car ownership, again, wasn't a big thing uh, yeah. back in the day. It, uh, it's one of these things that I feel, I, I, I've mentioned it a few times, I really feel like we, it's a shame that we got rid of all the little smaller stations in it. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, they would be full now, and people would be using them uh, all the time. Um, we were just, I mean, perhaps a decision to rationalise it was right, but we were too keen to rip them up yeah. um, and take away any any ability to reverse that decision. Um, yeah. 
But um, no, I, I remember my dad had a, we went camping uh, a couple of times up around Oban, up around Scotland. We did a couple of tours around Scotland. He had an old Austin A40. Uh, right. <laughs> which wouldn't mean anything to the vast majority of people who, who look at this. But my brother, at night, my brother and I used to sleep in the back of it. And my mum and dad used to sleep in the tent. You know, that was, that was camping. Yeah, yeah. Camping in the sixties and seventies, um, <laughs> but it, it was it was good fun. It was good fun. I mean, we did see. I mean, you were obviously restricted by range, so we never really got. I mean, I don't think we ever got as far north as Abbey Moor or even Inverness. Right. Uh, it was just too far in those days to go. So most of it was in around the central belt or Oban over to the west. That was about the maximum of uh, our limitation on holidays. But it was good fun. Yeah, uh, I remember when we were in Kinghorn in Burnt Island. We used to certainly for three or four summers went with all my cousins, and uh, you know, long hot summers as I remember them. Probably weren't, but I remember them as being long hot summers. I'm the same as you. I remember when I was uh, a kid because I grew up. I was born '76, so yeah. you know, like, uh, early '80s and things like that. I swear the summers were hotter here. I yeah. really do. <laughs> And we, we went, I mean, we were, when we were on holiday, it was almost as much a holiday for our, our parents because, you know, there was, there'd be, what, seven of us when all the cousins were there. And we would disappear after breakfast and come back, you know, dinner time. Yeah. Um, and the parents had the time to themselves and we had a great time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Were you the same? And I remember when I was growing up, uh, I was lucky we grew up in a little sort of cul-de-sac, so it was a fairly sort of uh, safe area anyway, just yeah. for us all to play. But it was out in the morning, and then you wouldn't, they wouldn't see us again until the streetlights came on. That was my yeah. signal. It's like, right, it's time to go home now, streetlights. And no mobile phones to keep in touch, nothing like that, you know? No, just well, in, I mean, in and out of... Kerstorfen, we used to, we, we stay in Kerstorfen and I have done the vast majority of my life. Um, and of course, the South Gale didn't exist in those days. None no. of that existed. So we used to cycle out past the fields out to Gogar Farm um, and, and spend the whole day out there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. There, there was a bit uh, round about me that it, it was just a little bit of wasteland that I've no idea who... But someone had went along and just mounded all these piles of mud everywhere, and it was great. We all just go, go on our bikes, yeah, just up and down. There wasn't a track as such, but someone had just came along one day and went there. You go, and then that was yeah. it. We were there for days and days and days all the time. It was amazing. No need to spend a thousand pounds on IT quit to keep people happy. No, no, that's, I spent most of my youth out and about playing, you know, hide and seek and all these sort of things. It's, yeah. it's, it is a real shame that it feels like that, that sort of stuff is disappearing a little bit. Or, or even, you know, when I was a teenager, down, down the park playing football, which you spent a lot of time doing, you know, you'd be playing 20-a-side football. Um, you, you quickly learned that two touches was dangerous because the time you had to touch the ball a second time, but three people had tackled you. <laughs> 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 I, was doing, I was actually doing it with my parents um, uh, a little while ago, dropping stuff off. And they still live in the same place I grew up. They, they haven't moved. And um, I just, I, you know how sometimes these memories come back to you. And I don't know if you remember, or you ever had, uh, played Kirby. Remember Kirby? Oh, yeah, yeah. I remember I, I, there was a bit of the, uh, that area where it was perfect for, you know, it was nice high curbs. And there was a, yeah. Yeah. You know what? I was brilliant at that. We should start a Kirby championship. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <a> game. <laughs> but you, you can't see the curves now for parked cars. No, that is true. We couldn't do it. No, we couldn't do it. No. <laughs> and so, as, as your position as Lord Provost, like, you've got a unique view of the city of Edinburgh, really. Yeah. So, that, uh, with, with that sort of special thing, it must be it must be amazing to see Edinburgh in that sort of light, really, from your position. Oh, it is, and you know what? One of the advantages, and there are many, of being in my position is you actually get access uh, to a lot of places that you wouldn't normally get access to. You're making uh, me jealous already. You're probably making me <laughs> jealous now. Uh, and 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 to meet people, really interesting people who normally um, you you would never you you would almost feel as though they're too remote to touch. But actually, once you get close to them, you find out they're just ordinary people. I mean, the, I mean, the, the, one of the most interest. I mean, there are so many interesting people. But one of the most interesting is actually Lord Lyon, um, 
who looks after all the heraldry and all, all the sort of legal stuff behind that. A, Joe Morrow, tremendously approachable man. But you see him in that position with all the gold on and the heraldry and you know, and you know what a phenomenal knowledge of Edinburgh that people have. Yeah. You know, um, I've learned so much about uh, the history of Edinburgh, the incorporated trades and the merchants and the burgesses, uh, your high constables, all that history, which we really need to write down somewhere and, <laughs> and make it more accessible to people. Yeah, you well, that's kind, of, that's kind of why I do the channel as well. And every time yeah. researching a new video, I, I never, ever stop finding out something new. It's incredible. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a fantastic city and you know, it's been through hard times recently, I mean the last 10, 12 years you know, since the financial crash and through the current one, but you know, there's, uh, there's worse cities to be, to be the, the, the Lord Provost of or the Provost of, this is a phenomenal city yeah. uh, with, with phenomenal people. Yeah, yeah we're, we're a unique breed aren't we? <laughs> well absolutely and I think what makes us unique is and again, this is just, it's not just come from research, because I obviously was aware of it. Edinburgh is predominantly a city made up of villages. Yeah. You know, you've got, you know, Stockbridge, Kerstorfin, Morningside, or oh, oh, I've forgotten a few, so Portobello, uh, Leith, um, as, as most cities were, because they all grew. But we seem to have had the ability to retain, although part of Edinburgh, we've retained the uniqueness that um, that makes up these individual villages. Yeah. Um, and while I would have said maybe four or five years ago, you could have started to see that breaking down slightly. This current COVID pandemic has actually re-established yeah. those local communities again and made them even stronger. And of course, this year, 2020, was supposed to be a, a, a major celebration. Um, it's 100 years this year since the, the Edinburgh Expansion Act which brought in Cramond, and Kerstorf and Gilmerton, Collington, Leith, uh, and a couple of others, uh, and more than trebled the size of the city. Yeah. Um, we, had a, we were planning a big central celebration, but we were also planning um, a celebration in each of the, the localities. So yeah. that the, the, and we were, we've, I've had the uh, archivists uh, working with local groups for the, for the last year. And the idea was to bring kids into it so that they understood the history of each of their individual villages and localities so that we didn't lose that. And that's been going great. Just, we can't have the celebrations, which is a real shame. That's actually heartbreaking because that's, that's, yeah. that, that is a massive thing to celebrate. It is, like, you're absolutely right. All these little areas, Stockbridge, Leith, uh, so all these little bits, they do have a real sense of community and a real sense of self mm -hmm. at the same time as being part of Edinburgh. And to celebrate that would have been amazing. There's so many things like that that we've just lost this year. And that's, that's heartbreaking, actually, that we yeah. might be able to do that. I mean, it's interesting. If you, if you speak to people um, when they're abroad, people will say, I'm from Edinburgh. If you speak to people in Edinburgh, they don't say they're from Edinburgh. They say, I'm a Leitha, I'm from Portobello, I'm from Christophan. And that's yeah. how people speak. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. It's, it's, it's lovely, actually. It, it really is. It really is. Uh, so we're, we're lucky to have um, an institution and a, a unique history, which you, you did kind of sort of start to touch on. And you yourself... I mean, you're in, you, you get to see that history round about you every day. I mean, that must be an incredible environment to work in and, and be in. It, oh, it is. And it, it's like most things, and I'll, I'll come back to you, but you know, at first you're in awe of it totally. And then you go through the bit where it's, I want to know everything and I want to dive into it. And then you get quite blasé about it. You know, say, oh yeah, that's, that, that, that's where it is. Robert Louis Stevenson met Robert Burns over there, or, you know, or, or things like that. You, you become quite blasé about a phenomenal history that we've got. But I think, you know, if, if you look at the history of Edinburgh, you've got everything. Again, in five, five four or five years' time, we're a bit flexible on this, uh, depending on upon where funding comes from, um, will be the 900th anniversary of the founding of the city. Right. 
So the city was founded by King David I um, with his royal charters <coughs> round about 1124, although we're not exactly sure of the date. It could be anywhere between then and 1127. Right. Um, and we're going to have our 900s whenever we can get Scottish government to give us the funding in the year that that that, that, that matches that within that period, because that right. would make sense. Yeah. <laughs> but, it's, but it's 900 years, but and, and if, if you look through Edinburgh, you probably see 500 years of history at a glance without having to go into archaeology, without having to go into um, in, into museums and, and, and to dig. There's 500 years of history in your face as you walk through the um, the old town. Yeah. Um, which which you know, I, 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 and it's accessible to people. You, know, you can walk down the courses that, that people. You can. I don't know if you've ever been into Mary King's course. Yeah, oh yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Which is for not you know, it seems such a simple idea, but actually thinking you know, somebody stood here 400 years ago, or it's, it's, you know, 350 years ago. Yeah. Um, but it's also the mixture. I think what we've become quite good at. We've got the old town. The new town obviously came out of the Enlightenment, which has a totally different feel to it. Yeah. Uh, you know, on the other side of uh, Princess Street Gardens, and that's one of my big bugbears of visitors to Edinburgh who keep calling it Princess Street Gardens rather than Princess Street Gardens. But I keep, hey, I keep saying that. And I keep saying that when I'm doing things. I'm like Princess, not Princess. <laughs> named after the king's two sons. It's not Princess. <laughs> that's right. Absolutely. <laughs> that, yeah, that's a bit of a bugbear. Too. You'd be surprised how many locals don't realise that either, though. Oh, I know. Well, <laughs> I, and a lot of that comes, and, we, and we've had lots of discussions in the in the council, and I've had discussions with the Scottish government. In schools, we don't teach Scottish history anymore. Yes, we don't. We, we, we teach empire history, uh, and and within Scottish history in Edinburgh, we don't teach Edinburgh history. In Glasgow, we don't teach Glasgow history, uh, and and it's all becoming homogenised. Yeah, yeah, yes, but I, I have to say, um, in primary school, when I was a kid, uh, my headmaster used to teach us Edinburgh history. Yeah. Just, uh, it was just an extra, you know, it was primary school, it was just an extra bit. And that gave me my grassroots foundation for my love of the history of the city and the country. You're absolutely right. I mean, we, we, we went on a different subject here, but you're absolutely right. I, 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 it's something that we should embrace, we really should. Yeah. But our history is part of what makes us special today, because we live and breathe our history every single day. Yeah. You know, if if you go to the assembly rooms in George Street, the assembly rooms. I mean, a lot of people don't realize the the rooms were built so that the great and the good, the thinkers, could assemble and stand and talk and walk. That's what the, that's what it was built for. Not for concerts. Not for exhibitions. It was built so that people could get together and talk. Yeah. So when you stand in the assembly rooms. You know, the, the great and the good of Edinburgh over the last three centuries have walked those halls yeah. and we're, we're, we're just standing ch chatting. A bit like the Advocates Library just off uh, Parliament Square, where the lawyers to this day still walk up and down having yeah. their conversations. Th that's living history. Yeah. yeah, that's living history. I think it's fantastic. Oh, I, I, I'm 100% I'm with you there. I mean, it's something that I'm incredibly passionate about and it's something that... I love, because we're very lucky with the channel that we're watched by people all over the world, America, Canada, Australia, all over Europe. It's amazing to have people who have, uh, a lot of them have roots here. You know, either they're, they've uh, got descendants from Edinburgh, they've got, uh, or, or they just expats themselves and moved away at a young age, and they've still kept a real love you know, and a real interest in it, and it's something that it's, it's it is an, an incredible history, and and uh, that it just seeps into you, really, doesn't it? It does. It does. It's absolutely. And you know, everywhere you go, there's there's a different story to be told. I mean, before I took on this job, I, I wasn't in, aware of the incorporated trades of Edinburgh and this association that still is ongoing. Um, you know, so you, and, and, and the incorporated trades were uh, at one time affected with the original police force of Edinburgh. Uh, you know, they, they were they were called the, the tradespeople were called to arms under the the, the blue blanket banner. Um, oh, okay, I, I don't know this. The, 
the, hist the history, you know, started off with the trades. Um, the, I mean, the blue blanket banner uh, ended up at Flodden, was the, the Battle of Flodden, where uh, the Lord Provost and the vast majority of Provost uh, councillors or burgesses of Edinburgh were wiped out at, at, at that day. Um, wow. we, we still commemorate that. We still have a blue uh, a blue blanket banner that the Incorporated Trades March under today at civic events. And so I'm, I'm a candle maker, by, by honorary candle maker. Wow. We have the hammermen, we have fleshers. Um, that, that, that history still is ongoing. That's and, because, and because we're Edinburgh, we have uh, the incorporated trades, but we, all have the, we also have the Royal Company of Merchants. And there was always a bit of uh, debate between the merchants and the uh, incorporated <laughs> trades. But it's nice I mean, that, it's only, that goes on still as well then. That's, even that itself is brilliant. Absolutely. We still have that. And, and, and we, still, we still have a... I think the first dispute I had to organise or, 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 or oversee at a civic event was should the merchants lead the incorporated trades or should the incorporated trades lead, lead the merchants <laughs> in a parade up the Royal Mile? <laughs> yeah, I can imagine that was quite a debate to have, actually. <laughs> so, uh, but no, it's, I, I, th I think these types of things are, are, uh, are, are absolutely fantastic. And the fact is that these organisations are still strong. They still exist. Uh, they still turn up to civic events. Um, it's great. Absolutely great. Yeah, yeah, it really is. It really, we've, we've obviously both share a real love and passion for it, which yes. is, I love, I love meeting people that have the same sort of passion as me with that sort of thing. Yes. Uh, on a slight sort of tangent, obviously, we, we're, we're world known, uh, renowned for the festival, which unfortunately yes. we've not had this year, um, as it is the same as uh, things have been, had to be postponed or cancelled all over the world, but it is something that's unique to Edinburgh. Like, I mean, what do you think really draws people to it around the world? Because it is, you know, it's something that personally I love. Well, I mean, each, we've now got 13 festivals throughout the whole year, um, uh, which is fantastic, you know, from, from the, the science festival for young, for young people, uh, through uh, jazz and blues, through art, uh, book festival, film festival, all the other festivals. Um, it, it's interesting, we had a, this is Friday, isn't it? Yeah, so on Monday we had a meeting with uh, the Royal Edinburgh Military Tattoo and the heads of festivals, and uh, our, our, our patron, the Princess Royal, was, was present. And we were all being a bit downbeat about COVID and, and people not coming. And she was making the point, looking at it as an outsider, there is an intrinsic wish to come to Edinburgh from people. It's, got, it's almost got a mythical quality about it, Edinburgh, uh, for people around the world. And, and part of that is to do with some of the great TV coverage that we've got. Uh, which shows our city, uh, I think, Sunsh it Sunshine on Leith, the film, has yep. probably got to be the best advert ever for Edinburgh. Some of that drone footage at the, at the beginning was uh, stunning. We'll, 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 give them, we'll forgive them for using Glasgow closes for some of the, the, the detailed stuff. But, <laughs> but hey, we're, we're flexible that way. Yeah. You know, but in Edinburgh, I mean, first of all, you can, if you're a performer, um, especially in the fringe, if you're a startup, you're something quite soon. Edinburgh is a stage you can come to, and nobody, nobody is going to say you cannot perform. Yeah. Now people might not turn up and watch you, but but you are allowed that platform for freedom of expression, and I think that is absolutely huge. Yeah. Absolutely huge. Um, you then have the situation that in July and August you've got four or five different festivals happening simultaneously in one city. Which is unique, yeah. Um, so and, and 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 mixed in between these formal festivals, which creates the atmosphere, creates the buzz. You've got street art, which is allowed to happen across the city. Street performers, you know, somebody juggling a chainsaw, or somebody somebody doing something else. It's absolutely brilliant. And so you've got this eclectic mix of people who have come for high art and the international festival and somebody who's come for the book festival, and somebody who's come for the fringe to see some of the extreme and exotic that goes on in the fringe. But they all mingle, they all mingle together, they all sit in the bars together, they sit in the cafes together, they sit out in the streets together. 
And I think it's that eclectic mix that is that once you've experienced it, it's very difficult to say I'm not going to come back again. Yeah, well, I, I, I completely agree. And, and going on with what you were talking about, you know, with uh, sunshine and lease and things, I had, uh, uh, I was lucky enough to get to chat to Jason Connery a few weeks All right. ago, well, who's obviously working on the new studios down in Leith. Yes, Leith. Uh, down in Leith. Yeah, to have these things sort of coming here more is what more is so exciting. Obviously, we had what was it a year and a bit ago? We had the new Fast and the Furious film in here, and then obviously previous to that, we had the Avengers film in here. It's it's really an exciting time for all these things, and I think long overdue for us, really. Yeah, I mean, what I mean, we've been trying well since I've been in the council, which is what eight years, we've been trying desperately to bring forward a project to have a, a proper film studio. Yeah, uh, you know, straight and out, straight and dull Keithway seems to be the area where we've got land to do that. And you know, a year ago, eighteen months ago, we were so close to doing that. A full yeah. production studio, um, it, it fell apart for legal reasons with a right. landowner. Um, but all the investment was lined up. It was an eight hundred million pound investment in a film studio with full production capacity, and uh, the the film academies from the various universities were going to move on to campus and make it a really exciting space Um, because what happens just now is we've got all these talented young people at our universities and colleges uh, involved in the TV and film production, whether it be cameramen, actors, joiners, stage management, whatever. And as soon as they qualify, they all head off down south. Well, we lose all that talent out of our city, which is criminal. I've got to say as well, and I'm I'm guilty of that because uh, I trained professionally as an actor and performer, and um, when I, I went to drama school, and immediately I went down to London to train. Yeah, because, would, because we don't have the facility here. If we had the facility, <laughs> you would then at least have the option to make a choice. At the yeah. moment, there is no option to make a choice. Yeah, yeah, I'm completely, yeah. With you. I'm completely with you there. The only this is a completely different thing, but the only other sort of bugbear, it, it's not a bugbear, it's a jealousy bit, I suppose. <laughs> I would be jealous that we don't have an arena for things as well, because obviously, you know, oh. Glasgow's got the SECC and they've got the hydro, like essentially in each other's car parks. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we don't absolutely. have an event space like that. That's that's a personal thing. I always feel it's a shame we don't have something like that. Well, I think, I think we missed it up. I mean, we've looked at it a couple of times out at uh, the airport area where there's land, uh, and there's always been a case of, and, and we've had all the top touring companies um, in to, to, to talk it through, and there's always been a significant gap that needed to be funded by the public, yeah. right, by public funding, and that, that we could never justify doing it. I think we've missed a real opportunity with the redevelopment of Meadow Bank um, I think we had the opportunity there to build a 10,000 indoor arena that could have been used as a 5G pitch for kids to play football and hockey and rugby during the winter, Yeah, but could also have been transformed into a 10,000-seater stadium or an 8,000-seater indoor stadium. And I think we, we just we didn't think big enough. And, and that's, that's one of Edinburgh's problems. It doesn't always think big enough. Oh, and we, we should, I mean, we're, it's the capital city of an incredible country Yep. We should take pride in it. We really, really should. And just and, and let our voice be heard properly. We really should. But we've always been a bit demure in Edinburgh. We don't shout about how good we are. Yeah, we're, we're we a bit demure that way, aren't we? <laughs> <laughs> um, we we know how good we are. We just don't tell anybody else. <laughs> well, whilst we're on sort of how good we are, obviously we've also got the biggest Hogmanay party in the world, the, the biggest yep. celebration. I mean, I, I, what do you think makes the whole world watch it? I mean, if I'm, be, if I'm being honest, I think the backdrop of the castle has got to be a huge, huge influence for that. I mean, people used to watch the fireworks off Sydney Bridge, and that's a bit, pla- you know, a bit blasey now, a bit, you know, passy. Um, but the castle, that castle silhouetted out with the fireworks, with the music stage in front of it, so that you're there, you're watching the concert, and you've got that phenomenal backdrop. Um, I think that's a big element of it. And I think the other element of it that, that, that brings people here to it, because you've got to remember, the vast majority of the, well, we're now limited up until this year. We have been limited up to 80,000 people in the celebration area in and around George Street and Princess Street and the Mound. Um, the vast majority of that are overseas visitors. 
yeah. who want yeah, to yeah. come and stand there and experience it. So you've got the backdrop, but I think also just the attitude of people in Edinburgh towards visitors. We are so open, we are so welcoming because we're just used to doing that and, and to welcoming people from all over the world. Um, I think it just creates that ambience that is that encompasses actually probably encompasses the Scottish the whole Scottish attitude of being welcome and, and opening. Not just Edinburgh. I mean, I think it'd be wrong for us to claim that we were unique in that in Scotland. Yeah, I, I, I can I, I completely agree. We do sort of go look. Our doors are open. Come say hi. I was chatting yeah. to, uh, again uh, Ian Buchanan, Scottish actor who's over in LA, and he was saying that he used to get a lot of other actors and producers and all these sort of things going. Oh, I'm going over to Scotland. Can you you know give me a, a route? And he would plan out a route for them around Scotland. And then they would also say, oh, thanks. I'd, I'd love to sort of say hi to your family and say thank you and everything. So he'd give, he'd give them their family address. And his family used to phone him up and say, can you stop sending these people? We don't know. Who. They were always so welcoming to them and say, oh, yeah, OK, come see this. But then they're like, we, all these people just keep showing up. <laughs> never, once, never once did they turn them away. Every single no. time. Yeah, OK, you come. How you doing? I have a cup of tea, yeah. Yeah. Same to Edinburgh, we'd be saying you've had your tea. You won't. Yeah, you've had your tea. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't. I'd probably a lot of people are saying that. I'm not sure what that means, but you know, that's that's, a, that's their stinginess at heart. There really isn't. It? Absolutely. <laughs> it almost sounds as if we're going to be generous, but we, but we, yeah, we can't bring ourselves to get there. Making you one. <laughs> <laughs> and so, what would be your top tips for anyone thinking about coming over and visiting us here? Once everything opens up again, obviously. And, and, and well, I mean, although I'm the Lord Provost of, of Edinburgh, I, 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 the first thing I would say to people is, don't just stay in Edinburgh. Don't just stay in Edinburgh. Get out and about. Um, I mean, it, it, before the before pandemic happened, seventy percent of all visitors to Scotland came through Edinburgh. Yeah, that was our point of arrival, yeah. and a lot of them just stayed here. Uh, so I, I would certainly say get out and about. The country is big. The country is beautiful. It's different in different parts. So, so get out there. Um, but when you're in Edinburgh, this is because this is where I want you to spend your money. You can go out anywhere else as long as you come back to Edinburgh and spend your money. <laughs> What's the day trip? I've got, I've got to do my bit for the city. Um, you know, in Scotland and in, in, and in Edinburgh in particular, we are really blessed that all our museums, all our art galleries are free of charge. Yeah. Free of charge. Get in there, they are full of fantastic pieces of information. Yeah. Uh, so make use of the fact that they're free. Go to our art galleries, go to our big museums, our small museums. But perhaps the most important thing is walk. Don't use a taxi. Don't use a car. I accept that there will be some people who require to do that through physical uh, uh, ability or disability. But if you can, walk, because you walk through the history, you walk through the beauty. More than 50% of Edinburgh is still green space, parks, gardens. Enjoy it. It's not a high density city like London or New York or, or, or even Paris to some extent. Um, it's low density, it's full of history. Just walk. And when you walk, look and see. Because you know, a number of people just will walk down the Royal Mile and you go, Well, what did you see? Well, I saw the shops, I saw this. Well, what about that close there? And what about that close? And what about the history that goes with that? Yeah. About what happened there? What about that mark in the Royal Mile where the last hanging took place? What about the, the outline of the flooding wall and the history? That goes with that. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the fact that Edinburgh was the, you know, the, the, the starting point for 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 printing and, and and literature. Edinburgh is the first city of literature in the world. Yeah. What a fantastic heritage we have in that city. So walk and look and take your time. Yeah, I could, yeah. I, I could not agree more. Is I, what I love as well is a lot of people who watch the channel. They've been before, and they've fallen in love with the place, and they want to come back. And and people even I'm fortunate enough to even have people who live here and, and things. And the people who live here watch videos and and go, I've walked past that every day of my life, and I yeah. did not know that story. 
when I've told a story yep. about um, Paisley Close or the sanctuary marks at the Royal Mile or the Flodden Wall where we've traced the roots, all these sort of things. And it's something that a lot of us just, we just don't know. We walk past and yeah. go, oh, okay, that just looks pretty. Or, oh, there's a gold brick on the ground. I wonder what that is. <laughs> well, I, no, I, I, absolutely. Absolutely. And I, I've lived in Edinburgh all my life and, and the number of things that I still see uh, that, 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 that I go, I didn't notice that before, or I noticed it, but I didn't understand it. Yeah. And just to take time. Um, I mean, I still think I bought a book a couple of years ago. It's a local, she's a, a, a local author, and she just, it was her first book. And it was all about the, the inscriptions and the signage on the gravestones in Greyfriars Kirk. Wow, right, okay. Which doesn't sound bad. But actually, when you start reading about what this means and what that, looks like and why people put that on there. Uh, it's tremendously interesting then. So I go to Greyfriars Kirk and then you start noticing things. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I've, I've probably walked through the Kirk umpteen times and never even noticed it. Uh, you love to know what this book is. I'm fascinated. <laughs> <laughs> I'll need to dig it out and fire it across to you. I've read it a couple of times. <laughs> um, just, I always like to finish with what I like to call uh, difficult questions for Scots. <laughs> Uh, so uh, these are these are sort of uh, sort of quick fire, but you know I might push you for for an elaboration on it. So, <laughs> shop bread or tablet? Or oh, tablet? Yeah, that, tablet that, every time. That's one of these ones that people are a bit like, I love it, but I can't eat too much of it. Well, it's just it's just, it's, just, it's just solid sugar. It has to be said. <laughs> <laughs> but it is lovely. We're My granny used to make it, that's why I love it so much. That's exactly what I was going to ask. That's everyone's <laughs> experience of it, isn't it? Is My granny used yeah. to make a tablet. My granny used to make a tablet. Uh, Iron Brewer whiskey. Oh. Ah, see? These are the difficult Probably questions. Probably both, but not in that order. <laughs> <laughs> or necessarily on the same day. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Or you can just, you can just mix them together. I mean, well, Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> Um, uh, square sausage or black pudding? Oh, square sausage. Yeah, you know, I was chatting to uh, Barbara Dixon last week, and she just, uh, she when I mentioned this question, she got so excited. She was like, oh, square sausage! <laughs> <laughs> it's one of the we, have, we, we, have, we have friends in Rochdale, and, and, and uh, Carol was, he, he's, a, he's a, a Lancashire man, a, a Rochdale man, but she's from Dunfermline, and every time we go down, we get the phone call, Bring some square sausage with you. Really? <laughs> <laughs> we smuggle it across the border. Haggis and tatties or mince and tatties? Ooh, tricky one, that one. It is, isn't it? It is. That's a tricky one. I'd have to say mince and tatties. Is that because your mum used to make it? No, it's because I make it and it's great. Ah, all right, okay, okay. <laughs> Because for me, it's because, you know, my, it's what my mum made, yeah. and I've said this to a few people, there's no one way of making it. Everyone, you know, everyone's got their own unique way. It was probably, if people of my age, it was probably a pretty much a staple diet. We probably had it two or three times a week. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and stovies another night. Yeah, so essentially <laughs> just the same thing in a different way. <laughs> <laughs> West gravy. No, no, no. <laughs> But I've, I've had this conversation with before as well, but it's like our diet of these sort of things, I mean, we're a cold nation. You need that, you need, you need that stodge to build up your, you know, your, your yeah. heat, essentially. It's, it's, That's why we all love soup. That's why we've always still got soup on the go. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's, it's uh, in our last DNA. But, last but not least, uh, Tonics Tea Cakes or Tonics Caramel Wafers? Oh, that's <laughs> the hardest question of the lot. Yeah, I saved the best to last. That's the hardest one of the lot. I'd have to say, I'd have to say tea cakes. Yeah. Yeah, I'd have to say tea cakes. Any particular you can, reason or just because you well, you can, you, you, well, A, I love them. But B, you can go through that sort of tantalising bit where you can peel back the chocolate and eat the chocolate separately and then get into the tea cake itself. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> everyone's, got, everyone's got a different way of doing it. I've got some people that have just went, I just shove the whole thing in my mouth and I want <laughs> Uh, no, they're not so good for dipping in a cup of tea, it has to be said. No, you know, no, you've got to have your digestive for that. No, no, no. But you'll have had your tea, so it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> now, Frank, this has been 
absolutely incredible. Thank you so much for, for taking the time out of what I can imagine is an incredible busy day to come and chat with me for this. It's been amazing. My pleasure. My pleasure, Tony. And I'll, I'll, I'll dig out that book for the Greyfriars Kirk and I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll get in touch with you and get it across to you. It's a fantastic read. That's amazingly kind of you. Thank you so much. Look after yourself. And you, and look after the family as well and all the best to them. That was brilliant. That was genuinely brilliant. Lovely, lovely gent to chat to. And I think for those of you who've watched the channel for a while, to chat to someone who has the same passion and interest, but far greater knowledge of the history of Edinburgh in Scotland was, it was so much fun. So, so, so I, I, I loved loved having that chat with Lord Provost to uh, the Lord Provost and all of uh, his office thank you so much for taking the time and chatting to me and organizing it and I have to say as well they've been great because they were actually <laughs> they were actually scheduled to do the interview with me on uh, the day after Kirsten's due date, which was the day after Lillian was born. So we had to reschedule the whole thing to do the interview. So uh, thank you to, to them for making the time and, and still doing the interview. Thank you so much. Um, again, guys, if you enjoyed that, please remember to give it a like, leave a comment, uh, subscribe if you haven't already. Keep yourself safe out there. Until next time, bye humans.